here's a scalding hot take. Coffee makes people tired and grumpy. If they skip their morning brew, coffee drinkers would perk up and get right on with their day, full of energy, no problems. Think about it. When people take their first sips of coffee in the morning, they're sleepy, grouchy, stumbling zombies. They have a problem. But shortly after they stop, they become energetic and active. Clearly, the act of sipping coffee is what's making people drowsy, while not drinking coffee makes those same people energetic and amped. So I guess I won't be needing this. Unless it's possible I've just made a mistake. Did I just throw out perfectly good coffee? Hi, I'm Sabrina Cruz, and this is Study Hall, real world statistics. Statistics helps us understand relationships between things so that we don't accidentally throw out all our coffee. But it can be tricky to figure out those relationships. Like, does coffee make you drowsy? or alert. If you feel relaxed when you're taking care of your adorable snake plant, maybe that's because snake plants relieve stress. Or maybe it's because you tend to water your plants at times of day when you're not too busy and already relaxed. Really getting to the bottom of how things influence or depend on each other is where statistics shines. To even get to that point though, we first need to quickly understand which type of statistics we're dealing with. One type is mostly about the relationships between things, and we'll focus on that in this episode. But before we get too deep into it, let's quickly go over what we call descriptive statistics. This is where we turn when we want to describe and summarize data. For instance, maybe you're calculating the average amount of juice per lemon in a bag, or the range of temperatures recorded by the nearest weather station. Here we're describing the data with a kind of summary, like the amount of tuna in a casserole. Mm. In general, descriptive statistics doesn't try to guess what we don't know, but it does help us understand what's currently happening and what we know to be true. Like the most common eye color globally is brown, or which day last week I had the most cups of coffee. But we might also want to generalize our conclusions to a bigger population, learn about the relationships between different things, or make predictions or inferences based on what we learn. Like, okay, we know that the lemons in our bag have an average juice content of two fluid ounces, which it's pretty juicy. But what kind of fertilizers and growing conditions lead to bigger, juicier lemons? And will the lemons from my lemon tree ever stack up to the ones in the grocery store? Inferential statistics help us draw inferences about a broader collection of things and answer those vital questions. We can get a feel for inferential statistics by considering Benito, the most enterprising middle schooler in his neighborhood. He's a cutthroat capitalist to his core and he's on a mission, a citrus mission. Right now, he's just got one side walk lemonade stand. But he doesn't want to be just any kid appealing to the pity of grown-ups. He's got big plans for a lemonade empire. So he needs to figure out exactly what moves lemonade and how to improve his sales so that he could take down big juice, namely the juice bar down the street. Benito notices that when temperatures rise, he seems to sell way more cups at his lemonade stand. But a hunch isn't enough for Benito, who wants to estimate the precise relationship between temperature and lemonade sales. Knowing that relationship will give him an idea of how much lemonade he can expect to sell, along with how much of his earnings to keep his profit and how much he has to spend on lemon sugar, and ice. In essence, our lemonade kingpin wants to learn about how temperatures drive sales in general from a sample of previous sales. He wishes he could control the weather, and he's furious that he can't. Yet. But he understands supply and demand, after all. And if he can't make the sun shine on command, he can at least understand how to work with the weather. Using a sample to infer something about a wider distribution, like Benito is doing, is a key part of inferential statistics. He's also trying to understand how temperatures impact or change his sales. Basically, you guessed it, he's interested in cause and effect. To kick off his pursuit of citrus certainty, Benito narrows down his problem to a specific question. How much lemonade can he expect to sell the next day given tomorrow's temperature forecast? For a statistical analysis, the first step is identifying key variables, or the factors our questions revolve around. For Benito, it's simply the average temperature on a given day and the number of cups of lemonade he sells on that day. These are both clear and measurable. 
cheerful. But other times, things are trickier. If Benito wanted to know whether being cheerful improves his sales, should he consider the amount of time spent smiling or number of personal questions asked? What about wearing a brightly colored t-shirt or some combination of all of those things? Remember, statistics can be applied to pretty much anything that there's more than one of, whether they're physical objects like lemons or even number of smiles in a day. Maybe one day he smiles 12 times and another it was 36, while the next day it was 50 because he was in a really good mood. The lemon stock market was soaring. For now, Benito's variables are temperatures and total cups sold, and his goal is estimating something about the population of the cups. Benito knows that in order to figure out how variables are impacting each other, he'll need to turn his question into a testable statement. Regardless of anything else, he predicts that the higher average temperatures increases the number of cups sold. That's his hypothesis, or proposed statement that can be tested. Benito now has two clearly defined and measurable variables, and he's saying something specific about the relationship between them. In this case, that they increase together. This is sometimes called a positive relationship because when one variable increases, the other one does too. There are other kinds of relationships we can consider. For example, Benito's arch beverage rival, the juice bar down the street, sells popular pomegranate hibiscus smoothies. Now, both cold beverage slingers might be surprised if they saw a negative relationship with warmer outdoor temperatures, where they see reduced sales among cold drink lovers despite the heat. A test a statement might speculate that there's no relationship at all. Who doesn't love a nice cold bevy at any time of year? In Benito's case, he might have argued that there's no relationship between temperatures and total sales of lemonade. Now, that's a perfectly valid, testable statement, even if it doesn't fit his actual hunch. No matter what, if we've got a testable statement about measurable variables, we're ready to roll. With that settled, we can really get down to business. Benito's statement argues that the increase in sales results from the higher temperatures. In other words, the number of cups he sells depends on the temperature. When we think a variable depends on another variable, we call it the dependent variable, which is very well named. It's the thing we're trying to explain and the reason we're asking the question in the first place. Dependent variables change as an outcome of or response to changes in other variables variables, which is why they're sometimes also called outcome or response variables. In his case, our lemonade legend's high or low sales result from changes in temperature. That's the heart of dependence. But what about the initial cause? As you might have suspected, the temperature part of Benito's statement is the independent variable. The temperature is the thing suspected of doing the influencing and generating some kind of change in the dependent variable. That variable is independent because it changes without the influence of our other variables. Variables. Benito can't control the sun. Yet. Of course, that doesn't mean nothing influences something like temperature. Temperatures do depend on the time of year, the air pressure, and rainfall, and climate change, anyone? But in this particular lemony analysis, temperature is independent because we know it won't change depending on Benito's sales. In this case, temperature is the cause in the chain of cause and effect. For that reason, independent variables are sometimes called predictor or explanatory variables. This is all clear in cases where we run experiments. Benito, for example, is running a correlational experiment. But let's go back to our unfairly maligned morning coffee. If we wanted to investigate the statement, coffee consumption improves alertness in the morning, alertness is the dependent variable, and coffee consumption is the independent variable. That's because the thing we're interested in is whether being alert depends on drinking coffee. To test that, you could control whether you drink coffee every morning or not, independent of any other factors. In other words, the things you control or manipulate as inputs into an experiment are independent variables, while the outcomes we're measuring to see how much they change in response are dependent variables. But sometimes there's not a direct arrow from one to the other. For instance, when it's sunny outside, more people might walk to work instead of taking a car or a bus. So back in Lemonade Land, it could be that the increase in people walking past the stand is what's driving Benito's sales, not the temperature itself. If that's true, even a cloudy day where a major road is shut for repairs might increase Benito's sales as people opt for walking and pass his stand. Unfortunately, they'll also be headed past the juice bar, so even as his sales rise, Benito is seething. 
A variable that might influence the dependent variable, but could also be influenced by our independent variable, is called a confounding variable. In some scenarios, that variable could also influence both dependent and independent variables. And if we don't consider possible confounding variables, we might get the wrong idea about how influential our independent variable really is. If walkability is the secret missing link between temperatures and sales, Benito could overestimate his sales on a hot day where a fall and tree blocks the sidewalk, discouraging walkers from going down that way. Keeping factors like these in mind will give Benito the statistical tools he needs to increase sales, build his lemonade empire, and crush big juice for good. Who do you think cut down that tree? Even if your dreams don't involve conquering the neighborhood beverage market, the relationship between cause and effect is important for understanding the world and making sure you don't throw out all of your coffee. But silly examples aside, these tools really do apply in less whimsical situations. Let's say you live in a place where the air or water is contaminated. That's an effect. And the cause might be that a company released toxic chemicals nearby. Or take how many black communities in the US have higher health disparities than white people. Now you might think that the health disparities are dependent on race, but there are confounding variables, including racism and systemic inequities. These are all things we see every day in the real world. And they're part of why being totally explicit as you consider your independent and dependent variables is an absolutely crucial step in mastering statistics. The language of dependence is the starting point for diving into the nature of how any number of things in the world affect each other. And that's kind of why statistics is so useful in the first place. If you're enjoying this series and are interested in taking the full study hall real world statistics course and earning college credit from ASU, check out gostudyhall.com or click on the button to learn more. And if you want to help us out, give this video a like, smash that subscribe button, and tell us what capitalist empire you tried to start as a middle schooler. For me, it was potions. Thanks for watching. See you next time.